14th annual Hip Hop and Politics Summit. Uh, this, this one brought about, uh, I was talking to uh, the soon to be Prime Minister of Belize. Uh, this was brought about because when I, when I ran for, for office uh, after having lost another race, uh, my opponents were trying to bring up my arrest at 17 as a young activist at a mosque, but they brought up, you know, he used to be a rapper. I'm a failed rapper. Kevin, <laughs> Kevin I auditioned for Russell, and uh, he had a best friend named, uh, named Kenny Lee over the phone, but uh, they, they were looking for Bone Thugs at the time, but I love Bone Thugs. But I'm a failed rapper. Open up for pop, short, but they were using it as a tool to integrate me. And I said, I love hip hop. Hip hop loaded me. Hip hop helped my vocabulary. Hip hop gave me confidence. And so this, from the platform, to see how this community, our community, can leverage our voting block in a meaningful way. Far too often, we see elected officials come to the community for our vote. But when they get into office, they against you and my interests. So now we have the experts here to show up and show out and give you all the firepower that we need to leverage our voting block to make meaningful change. So thank you for coming out. I bring you Brother Cameron Trip. Hello, people. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, thank you, Congressman Carson, for always leading and making sure hip-hop is present here during uh, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference. Uh, happy and thank you for having me again to moderate this uh, for two years in a row. Uh, we don't have a lot of time today. We have a captive audience, so we're going to jump right into this conversation. Uh, we've got some really esteemed guests here uh, uh, and panelists, uh, and I'll start left to right. Uh, immediately to my left, we have uh, the Honorable Dr. Sean Barrow, uh, the Opposition Leader of the Felician House of Representatives. Please come up. <laughs> the next to him, uh, we have Linda Sarsour, the Executive Director of Empower Change and the co-founder of Until Freedom. Uh, and immediately to our left, we have Kevin Lyles, uh, the chairman and CEO of 300 Electric Entertainment and a legend uh, in the, uh, one of, I would say, the quintessential hip-hop executives uh, of the last 30 years. Uh, and then over there, uh, I have a point of privilege. Uh, one of my Howard among my brothers, H.U. You know. Uh, <laughs> Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr. is the president, co-founder, and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus. Oh. Uh, and then lastly, on, on the end, last but definitely not least, uh, we should say, uh, we have Mr. Cameron Anuba, the head of public policy. Uh, head of Public Policy for Prime Video and Amazon Studios. Um, and to our panelists, the mics, uh, you should have the mics and the chairs. Uh, and so this is going to be a little bit of a test and test testing everybody. I still, I still got their point. Yeah. <laughs> That's good one, too. Uh, and then before we start, I just want to thank everybody who was able to make this panel uh, come together, especially uh, the diligent team in D.C. and in Indianapolis, uh, uh, Congressman Carson. So if you're <laughs> thank you So uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, Hip Hop 50. Hip Hop was 50. 50 years old this year. Uh, that means there's probably somebody who's one years old, 75 years old, and touched in part of the through line of the culture and generation of hip hop. Uh, in this panel, uh, this year is the title of Activism, Culture Revolution, and Entrepreneurship. Um, this is an open initial question to the panelists in terms of are there any specific moments that you see as you reflect on hip hop's 50 years and multiple generations? that really spoke to the activism, the, act, the activism and the revolutionism of hip hop that really impacted you as a working person. 
I'd like to uh, jump in all the way from Belize and Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, being, being what some may consider a legend myself in hip hop, you, you forgot that, that part. <laughs> the, the Grammy Award winning. Uh, that gentleman right over there gave me one of my, my biggest deals at Def Jam. Um, but I, I, I think we were talking about the COVID Die uh, movement, you know, that helped our 44 president of the United States uh, get elected, uh, you know, in hip hop. was so active. And that, that was a moment, that was really a defining moment. You know, uh, Russell Simmons, Diddy, Jay Z, all the hip hop luminaries really came together uh, to help. Uh, with that election. So that comes to mind. Um, shit, I'm 50. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Blame it on my, 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 not my heart. I, just, I come from a different place. So I'm 55 years old. Uh, to see the progression and the acceptance of our culture, um, to see people who, like with me, I, I'm hip hop saved my life. At 16, I was supposed to be on drugs and jail and dead coming out of Baltimore. So to, to sit and have friends that now can take our power and make policy, um, we be, but we've been doing this from day one. I, I just with one of my sisters to Kev. We have an office of gun violence now here. In the, or, was it supposed to announce that? What is going to happen, supposed to happen soon? Um, and we've been stomping at the White House forever. But now we're, we're not just talking to people who grew up in a different era. We're talking to a, us. And I, I just want to take a, a, a moment to say when you talk about the topics, activism, entrepreneurship, all those things, that's been hip hop since the message. It's nothing you can say, and to see the, the struggle um, that my brother Sean was over there, able to overcome, and to say that he's gonna be a prominent. See, y'all y'all, y'all act like y'all don't remember Sean. Yeah. Y'all act, act like that he wasn't, he wasn't one of the guys that we wanted to be like, he was, he was where we wanted to rap like, and just, and now I want to be astute like, because I'm going to be a prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> well, he is, but I'm going to be right next to him. <laughs> if anybody else, Reverend Gilworth. Yeah. I, I'd just like to add that the impact, the second part of your question was how the impact. And, and that's why I'm here today uh, as the next Prime Minister of Belize. Not for the sake of the title or the sake of the image, but for the sake of the change, the, the policy, the legislations that create the society in which we live, uh, not just people of color, but especially people of color. Um, and to go from being a musician that complained uh, vociferously about the harsh realities that I suffer as a young immigrant from this country who, uh, despite the harsh realities I was able to overcome, thanks to people like Kevin Miles and Diddy and, and Russell Simmons uh, that gave me those opportunities, but there are far too many other uh, people that are struggling in these urban cities. And to go from being the subject of that suppression and oppression to now being someone who has the power to create legislation and policies to uplift people, to empower people, to alleviate poverty, to do all the things that I rapped about, to solve all those problems, that is hip hop. That's what Chuck D is talking about. That's what, that's what we all rapped about. You know, hip hop has always been aspirational. Hip hop has always been uh, vivid in our descriptions of the reality and how we'd like to see it manifest and the ultimate level is the Oval Office and the Office of the Prime Minister, and this is hip-hop. One, one thing I want to talk about in terms of, I look at, especially the last Jim Cameron, Reverend Yearwood, Kevin and Linda, you all either represent organizations, companies, or platforms. 
but the platforms that are now available for hip hop to be able to express that activism, express express that voice, to drive that voice are so important. Under what I think about empower change into freedom, these organizations are a hip hop caucus, and they're definitely cameraing with Amazon and the behemoth that it is across entertainment, uh, not just only in music, but in movies. Uh, can you speak about what you see as not just the now, but the now as we go into these next 10, 20 years of where platforms and organizations and companies uh, to allow for that voice to actually be heard? Well, can I just say really quickly, uh, I, I, I might be the youngest person on the panel. I was born in Los Angeles in 1992, and uh, no disrespect, no disrespect. <laughs> but I was born in LA in 1992, and we had riots in Los Angeles in 1992. And you can either learn about the Los Angeles riots through what you watched on CNN, or you can learn about the Los Angeles riots through Ice Cube's death certificate album. And there were different people who were seeking different pieces of information, or who wanted to be felt and heard in different ways. So when you talk about platforms, um, Alexa was asked to play hip hop over one billion times as of today. And so it's not just a matter of being able to physically have Ice Cube's death certificate album in 1992 so that you can learn about what's happening in LA, whether you be in Miami, Miami or Mumbai. It's the reality that what streaming has been able to do is to allow our culture, hip hop culture, to be accessible all over the world instantaneously. And I think that says a lot about telling our story, the black American story, as well as the sub-stories of Atlanta, Los Angeles, Baltimore, New York, so on and so forth. Because what hip hop really is, is it's an American story through the eyes of different artists in different cities. And so I do think they're very much connected in terms of uh, the 50 years of hip hop in some key moments, as well as where we are today and what different organizations or platforms exist. So, sorry, Linda, I know, uh, no shade. That was a bold statement. <laughs> a lot of courage um, I, I, uh, one of the other one of the real credentials that I have that brings me to the stage is I'm from Brooklyn that's why Congressman Carson brings me up because he wants to listen to me and my Brooklyn accent um, I do want to mention something really important and I do come here on behalf of my colleagues who many of you know until freedom who's outside right now they they working uh, right now, um, we're working in Kentucky and we can talk about that a little more because I need some people to pay attention to what's happening in Kentucky right now before we set some really bad precedent for 2024. I come on behalf of a lot of hip hop artists who have joined us in the movement on the front lines like my son, the General Lennon from the Bronx, some people like Trey the Truth from Houston, Texas, and Bun B and others that have really used their platforms to come outside and talk about what really needs to be spoken about who have started working on the de-glorification of violence um, in, in, in some elements of hip hop. But one of the most dangerous trends that people are not really paying attention to is prosecutors across the country, some of whom are black prosecutors, yeah. who are using rap lyrics to criminalize people in our communities, who are charging people based on words and not in fact action. So we need to be really careful about not allowing 50 years after hip hop, and after, for me, hip hop, for someone like me from Brooklyn, was an opportunity to walk in the shoes of other people that I may not be like. It was storytelling. It allowed us to understand the war on drugs and the impacts that it had on black and brown people. It allowed us to understand the struggles of black people in communities like where I'm from in Brooklyn. And so it was an opportunity to go inside communities that we were not from. And then it actually evolved into the opportunity of activism and getting people to understand how do we make change? How do we transform? How do we talk about manhood? How do we talk about womanhood? How do we talk about different concepts and ways that people get? Because music is universal. And that is why hip hop is being played one billion times on Alexa. And you better believe it's by every person of every kind, of every age group, of every part of the world, because hip hop brings people together. So we have to keep that legacy alive and not allow prosecutors to start using hip hop as a way to criminalize young people in our communities. They may need some support, they may need some help, we might need to be doing some more you know, mentorship and all that other good stuff that people are doing in the community, just to be quite clear. But we just we need to stand up to these prosecutors that are trying to use hip hop to criminalize those in our community coming on up. Protect Black Lives. I'm actually living it every single day. A father of six can't be home, but you can actually come to the Capitol and re do a resurrection and you get bombed. 
but it, here's a, a 28 a Rico shot. I'm, I'm living it every day. But these, these guys are not just hip hop artists, they're fathers, they're sons, they're community people who try their best, but may not, may not have grew up in the, the right way and had to find their way. And um, I just hope that you talk to the, the legislators and, uh, and people in, in Congress and know we have some great bills that have been passed. Um, it's funny, uh, you know, we talk about New York and hip hop, but California was the first state to actually sign on. So shout out to LA uh, for it. And we have uh, uh, the Rap Act, which is um, my man Jamal Bowen, Bowen and Congressman Hank Johnson uh, that we're trying to get nationally. And we got things moving in New York and Illinois and so on. So it, it's such a serious issue. I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, it's such a serious issue because the people who have spent 10, 15, 20 years behind bars because they said a certain lyric. And if it's happening to rap, it's gonna happen to movies, it's gonna happen to books, it's gonna happen to eventually everybody. So it's not just about rap music, it's about an attack on black and brown people and our creative expression, so. I think one of the things here, so first and foremost, I am always at all, when I look out into this audience and see how it has grown every single year. Yeah. I am just blown away that they can't find a room big enough. And I just want to say that, that you are the inspiration of what we need to do to fight for our liberation. I also have to give um, on the stage, without a doubt, to my dear brother, Congressman Carson, uh, you should know that when the Hip Hop Caucus was created, uh, now 19 years ago, uh, Sean, I remember I was one of the co-creators of the Vote or Die campaign on the political side and worked with the Hip Hop Summit Action Network. Um, and in that time when we were creating the Hip Hop Caucus, and we came to the Congressional Black Caucus to have a room, there was no room in the end. They did not allow us, the, to be honest, because it's the hip hop panel, to keep it above. It was actually at that time when they, was, they were watching Fox more than they were watching us, and they were afraid that if we had a session that was called hip hop, it would turn into a riot or something wrong. And so we actually had the first hip hop caucus discussion and panel at my alma mater of Howard University on September 11th of 2004. But that came because there was no room here. And then when we came back, um, it, obviously we thank uh, Cosman Maxine Waters for having the young, gifted, and black. It began to enter Inter, in a, in a tweet and intertwine and bring in hip hop into that conversation, but it still wasn't called hip hop. It wasn't until Congressman Carson came and he was like, Rev, with the hip hop caucus, let's actually do a hip hop panel. And the room was very small, actually. We, I think, other parts of the room, we had a room, but every year since then we've grown. And the conversation is this is that over the 50 years of hip hop, what is critically important is the evidence you see here from the Kevin Lyles who was the entrepreneur and the CEO, to Sean who was running for prime minister, to so many who are using, to, to no name and to many other artists, while they're using their platform to how they can, how they can explain one's cultural expression to shape one's political experience. And so the reason why we're here today, in the words of N1, was on a panel with my dear brother, Dr. Roger Mitchell, who just came out, who was the former medical examiner for DC, just wrote a book called Deaths in Custody, studying how many of us are killed in custody and just looking for the check mark we put on the death certificate when we are killed in custody. But in that process, the words of N1 is different. They would say that it is bigger than hip hop. And so what I would want to say here today is that what we must leave here in hip hop is in the word of Tony K. Bambara, it is the role of the artist to make the revolution irresistible. And what we must 
come here now is that last week, 10,000 people in Libya were washed away. We must come to the fact that those in Morocco, thousands have died because of earthquakes. We must come to the fact that when the Canadian wildfires were, were coming toward the whole East Coast, that it was causing us to have asthma and emphysema and cancer. We must know the fact that in Arizona and in New Orleans and throughout Texas, that our grandmothers were literally cooking to death because they could not afford their air conditioning. We must deal with the fact that there are white supremacists who are going to dollar stores and grocery stores and churches and hunting us down. We must deal with the fact that while our parents fought for equality in the 20th century, we are now fighting for existence in the 21st century. So we must understand that either we shape policy or policy shapes us. And so this is not a game for us. This is not a time for us to play around with this. So we need the artists and the musicians and the filmmakers and the poets and the dancers and the executives. We need them to use their gift to be the best storytellers and, and create the best narrations. But the fact of the matter is this. We are dying. And we're dying more now than we were 50 years ago. And so because of that alone, if we are not using everything in our arsenal to ensure our people are living, then the CBC process, the AMC process, even the Hip Hop Caucus process is a mockery if our people are dying in the streets. Now is the time for us to play together and be about what we have to have real health care, real education, real fighting back voter suppression, issues of economic justice and climate. Now is the time to get serious. And if you are in this room, that means you have an inkling of what it means to shape policy. And so this conversation must be, well, how do we get the lease? Or how do we get the boardroom? Or how do we get those in positions who have to be the spook who sat by the door? How do we, because God didn't put you in a position to be a black face around white people, to be their cow timid, it's in when you ain't been scratched and lack of you ain't been tickled. God didn't put you in a position like that. God put you in a position to fight for our people. Thank you. In the spirit of uh, proper politics, uh, we have, uh, who I did know. New York. New York is in the house of the down block. Uh, the three down blocks, Jamal Bowman. Do you know I'm good. Oh, okay. Uh, peace and love, y'all. How y'all doing? Yeah. Peace and love. What's up, Brother Carson? Good to see you, man. Thank you so much for sitting around me. Say a few words. What's up, Brother Shine? What's up, Linda, Kevin, everyone, man? Good to be here with y'all. Just want to send everyone love and thank you for being in this room. This is the moment in our nation's history where we're going to build power within the hip hop culture and community. That's the goal, that's the mission. Once we, in the culture, organize to build real political power, we're gonna bring transformational change to this country right now. Not 100 years from now, not 50 years from now, not 20 years from now, not 10 years from now. It's gonna happen right now, and that's what Brother Carson is doing. Thank you so much. 5 p.m. today, room 145. Rap on Trial, the Rap Act, is a panel that I'm going to be hosting. Brother Kevin Louse is going to be on, along with uh, Brother Prophet from BMAC and so many others. I love you. Let's keep working. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to pull on a thread in, in a statement that the Reverend made, that the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible, specifically to Shine and Kevin first, and the, as being superstar artists or having nurtured so many superstar artists careers we want to come out of here with some solutions what are the things we really need to do we here anybody who's watching listening to be able to get artists to make and, and really 
put it pour into so they follow the trade the troops they follow the my sons and they work with linda they work with hip-hop caucus they work with hip politics what are those things that we really need to translate what are we not getting here in this political class to be able to translate to get more artists to be involved and put the in, in, involved in these organizations you, you know i think a lot of artists uh, are involved but I, I think we have to come up with a new path to power. We have to evolve. And I think the next level now is that we have to find our own candidates for the Senate, or for the House, and can we were talking about uh, local government, for the sheriffs, for the, for the DA, for all these people that are making decisions that are adversely impacting uh, you know, the most vulnerable amongst us. So we need to find our own candidates, and we have to maintain our integrity. Hip hop is not for sale. I see, you know, some of these artists and some of these people, you know, making deals with uh, treacherous, you know, despicable human beings that are a detriment to humanity. Not just Black America, not just uh, White America or Latin America, but to humanity. And so. One thing hip hop never did was sell out. If you sold out as a hip hop artist, you didn't really survive. So I think we need to keep our integrity. We need to create our candidates. If we're not satisfied with the candidate pool, we need to create our candidates. I'm, I'm not telling you to be a Democrat. I'm not telling you to be a Republican. I'm telling you, let's, you know, we could be independents and we could demand the policies that we want and find the candidates. We have the money. We can finance our own uh, candidates to make the implementation of policies that we need because that's where we are now. It's all about policy. It's all about legislation. Uh, I think we've popularized uh, the movement enough in the sense of getting involved, but the involvement can't be the best of the worst. And I think that's where we are now. You know, I see people, uh, you know, they, they meet with the Republican uh, candidate for president. And it's like, well, you know, I gotta get that bag. Uh, you know, it's about the money. Uh, but then I'm like, you're driving a Rolls Royce and you're flying a private plane, but you know, there's still police officers that are gonna assassinate you because of the policies of that president and the climate and the hostility that they've created for people that look like you. So, so we can't be for sale. Um, and, and again, if you don't like the two presidential candidates or you don't like the Republicans or the Democrats, let's create our own party. The yeah. hip-hop party. Yeah. I, think, I, I think the misconception is that we are not involved. Um, I go back to remember LL performing for Clinton. We, we've been, hip-hop, hip-hop hip was born out of us not being satisfied with the actual political situation, the policies that were going on. And because we're 50 now, we're pulling up our pants and we're making a lot more money and we're having a lot more influence, nothing moves in America without us. So you want to fuck the problem in the audio? We're going to fuck with you. You want to cause a problem here? We're going to, he's going to be prime minister, we're going to have a governor here, and I, I'm going to, I hosted um, the FBI um, and 60 HBCU presidents. And I want to tell you what Rashawn said is so important. So this kid, he's an FBI agent in Atlanta. And Aubrey, what was the, the case that happened? Ahmaud Aubrey. So he was actually the lead investigator for that case. George Floyd didn't have an African-American lead investigator. So this guy got the conviction, the whole thing. He said, I get death threats. This is an agent, I get death threats. I, I'm, I'm afraid, but I, I come from hip hop and I was not gonna let them kill that guy and not go to jail for it. So whether it's the sheriff or prosecutor, or, we have to position ourselves to even police the police uh -huh. And uh, uh, out, forget about poli the politicking and, and actually do the job. Like I, I, I'm here because I know Andre does the job. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm here because I know Jamal is going to do the job. And yeah, we're not scared. That's right. what, what, what are you really afraid? And for, for the, I don't want to call them 
We know the people who try to scoop with them, try to do it. We try to do it. Yeah. Whatever you would call it. If you have a job and you have the opportunity, the access, don't be no scared. No, 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 no. no. Because one thing, one thing that hip hop should show you, with all the resistance and uh, the way the station that played more music and no rap and all the stuff that they've done to Corn us. Tell, bro, see Dolores Tucker. <laughs> Go, anything with the number one consumed music in the world right now, through all the bullshit. And so all I want you to do is understand the power that we possess and it's nothing to be afraid of if you're working with the greater good and greater God, because hip hop, it's number one. And I, I think I'm not even done yet to the point where I see somebody asking me what's going to happen 50 years from now. Uh -huh. We will have probably 40 to 50 percent politicians. We're going to have many governors and mayors. But to those future governor mayors and future politicians, don't be scared. Don't be scared. I think it's important to call out, though, that we are able to be in a situation where we are not scared because you exist, Mr. Wiles, because you exist, Mr. Carson, because you exist, Mr. Bowman. The reality here is that you guys did not have what I've had, which is to be able to grow up and say you can be authentically black and successful in corporate America. You can be authentically black and make a difference in the halls of power. And we should understand that of the top 10 largest cities in America, uh, by the time Philly inaugurates their next mayor, of the top 10 largest cities in America, they will have six black mayors most of whom are direct products of the hip-hop generation. So what do you do with that? When you go home to Philly, when you go home to New York, when you go home to Atlanta, when you go home to Houston, what are we doing with that? We put them in these positions of authority. We know that they understand the struggles and the plights of our communities, right? So the responsibility is on us to hold our leaders accountable. It is not the responsibility of the constituency to meet policymakers where they are. It is the responsibility of policymakers to meet the constituency where they are. We have power. We have power. And so I think we take the mantle that the leaders in this room are currently holding, and where are we going over the next 50 years? And I do think you're right. It's, it, it is more of us in Congress. It is more of us in the Senate. It is more of us as governors. But we have to be willing to do it in a way that is authentically black. And that is a conversation that we also have to have within our own communities, because that is a significant generational difference between some of who may have come before us. And I think that's worth calling out. I'm just going to interject a second um, on this one because I'm with Kevin on the vision, but in order to execute the vision, you got to do the work. And I listened to a sermon by Dr. F. Bruce Williams from Louisville, Kentucky, powerful brother that I hope was brought to CBC. And he did this sermon a few weeks ago. It's on his. It was at the National Council of Black Churches convention. And, he, and, this, and this applies to the church, to the mosque, to the synagogue, to the temple, to everybody. But it was about the church. He said the trouble with the church is that the church ain't troubled enough. And so... Sit, sit there. I'm just saying... Let me get that rewind. I'm going to say that again because it was good. That was Dr. F. Bruce Williams. It ain't my words, just so we're all clear. He said, the trouble with the church is that the church ain't troubled enough. And so the point that he made in his sermon was that the people ain't outside. And there are people that are dying in our communities. And there are migrants in our communities. There are young black boys in our communities that need us. There is an opioid crisis across our communities. There are people who literally can't pay their rent, can't feed their families. The unemployment rates in parts of the country, the lack of infrastructure in parts of the country. And the people ain't mad enough. I don't know how many people gotta die in our communities or how much destruction has to happen in our communities for people to say enough is enough. I wanna remind you that in every generation since the days of the founding of these United States of America, every generation got a little more. Just a little bit, a little more, a little more. Do you know that you are the first generation in American history that has to tell a younger generation that they got less rights than you? Yeah. 
That never happened. But the people ain't mad enough. Congressman Bowman's from New York. We lost five congressional seats in New York. Not in Alabama, not in Louisiana, in New York. The people are not mad enough. I'm with you. Give me black people to vote for across the country. I want to see representation. I want to see powerful people who believe in liberation. And I learned this from organizing, as you know, with Tamika, with, with Mice, with Rachel, with so many other black folks that are in this room today, Erica and others. I learned this. All skin folk ain't your kin folk. So, for example, this is where I'm gonna get back to the point that I was gonna say earlier. We're organizing, I came from Kentucky. Kentucky elected the first black attorney general in that state. So people will say history was made. Y'all can clap and say history was made, but you, not you, but Daniel Cameron is not our friend. Daniel Cameron has a public safety plan that says drug dealers, if arrested in drug-related offenses, they're going to be charged with murder charges. If Kentucky was a country, it would be the seventh country in the list with the highest incarceration rate in the world. Wow. That is the state where this prosecutor, who could indict a ham sandwich according to the people, that's what they say, you can indict a ham sandwich. But he couldn't figure out how to indict police officers who murdered Brianna Taylor. Yeah. And now, he's endorsed by Mitch McConnell, he's endorsed by Donald Trump, wins the Republican nomination, and thinks he's gonna mosey on up to the government. Let me just tell you this much, over our dead body. Yeah. But, but, but this, hold on. We often talk about voter suppression and all the stuff that happened in the 1950s and the 1960s. This is a public story that I'll tell you just happened a few days ago. We're registering voters in Kentucky. People call in the hotels, trying to figure out what hotels we're at. Call the hotel to the point that the FBI had to come because they wanted to shoot up a hotel that we were staying at. They knew the color of the car that we were driving in Kentucky. So today, in 2023, we're experiencing the, take, the same type of voters. People are risking their life just to register voters in our community. And so the church ain't troubled enough. The community is not troubled enough. At some point, somebody got to say enough is enough. And I agree with you. Don't let any political party take your votes for granted. So we are in a situation where if you're good, then no, people are not worried about anybody else. This is a country that, ha that has taught you individualism. Yes. I don't come from that kind of culture. Sure. I come from it takes a village. Yes. I come from my neighbor is not going to go to bed hungry. Yes. This country tells you if you got health care, you got a job, your kids are good, don't worry about everybody else. That's the, that's the mindset. And so if we're going to elect people from our community, if we're going to put people forth in our community, put people with courage, people who are brave, people who are willing to risk it all. Don't put people that are willing to cow to the opposition just to make them feel comfortable. Because that's what we do in the movements all the time. We're always trying to make white people comfortable. And I'm tired of it. So in this room, 2020, them corporations, they were like, black people, lives matter. They were whipping that money out, flying all over the place. Guess how much money is out here right now? Zero money's out here right now. So when it's trendy for black lives to matter in 2020, that's when the corporations get up. But when there's climate catastrophe in our community, there are forest fires happening, people are being displaced across this country, an opioid crisis. The movement that we're in right now got no resources. People put money out their pockets. Kevin's out here supporting people. That's why Paul Robeson said, artists are the gatekeepers of truth. Yeah. These are people that have come out of the communities that we are from. Yeah. And so there is a responsibility on them. I don't think nobody's doing me a favor. Trey the Truth is not doing me a favor <laughs> when he comes up to Kentucky to organize with us or comes with us to Georgia or to Florida. We see that as a responsibility of artists across this country. When we reached out to artists, when Breonna Taylor was murdered, we called Cardi B, and we called Alicia Keys, and we called sisters across the country in Rhapsody, and we called brothers, and we said, use your voice, start talking, because we will not allow another black woman to get murdered and for her name not to be said in every corner of this world. And that's how Breonna Taylor 
is going to be a, a legacy of ours in this movement. So I just want you all to know, yes, hip hop is important. Yes, the artists got to be involved and that's cool, but you got to be involved. Yeah. You have to be outraged at the moment that we are in because it is absolutely outrageous. And I hope that you don't want your legacy to be that you got another generation less rights than you have. And that's the kind of work that needs to be done right now. For the Hip Hop Caucus, you know, you've been around this for many, many years. And I think one thing that we understand that politics is 50 plus one. Let me say 50 plus one. 50 plus one. That's not really good enough. 50 plus one. 50 plus one. All right, so I'm going to give you a, a demonstration. So all those who are in front of me on this side of the room, put your hand up. So I want, yeah, everybody on this side, put your hand up. Just put your hand up. Okay. Now look to that side of the room. Just look over there. So this side wants something that you don't want. Okay, put your hand down. So this side, now you put your hand down. Okay, everybody on this side. Look, look at that side over there. This side wants something you don't want. Okay, put your hand down. So now this is, this is where we are. There are two sides. What we will do is that we will just speak to this side here and not know this other side exists but they want what they want as much as you want in other words while you want to fight oppression you want better health care you want better schools this side doesn't want you to have that you need to understand what i'm saying so 50 plus one the brother here in the, in the nice light blue suit so but you can stand up okay so, 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 so this is the thing. If this side wants something and the other side wants something, but that's the plus one. And y'all need, need to be honest, what I'm saying. If that's the plus one, then you need to not just keep having preaching to the choir moments. You have to convince that one. Thank you, perhaps. You got to convince that brother to get in line to what you're talking about. Right. But if you don't do that, politics is a science. Yeah. Yeah. There must be an inside and outside game. Yeah. Congressman Bowman, Congressman Carson, hopefully Prime to shine, they have to do things differently on the inside. Lennox Resort, Red Deerwood on the outside must do things on the outside and we must all be working together to get to 15 plus one. That's politics. But if you come in here and don't understand how politics works, you will be frustrated. Demonstration without legislation leads to frustration. And so you have to understand how this works. And so what I'm saying to you is that we have to find others who share our solidarity. We have to find other communities who are going through the oppression and work with them. We have to find other folks in maybe in red states. That's come question is in Indiana. Right. We have to find, we have to work there. We have to get outside of where we normally work in this political structure. Because if not, we will not have what we need. And to do that, we have got to have resources. Linda said it best, he who funds you is he who controls you. So if you have a party funding you, they're going to expect you to go along with that mission. So if we, in this room, are not even putting up money to fund our liberation, then how are we actually going to do this work in the first place? Exactly. So we got to do that, and then we will see our success happen. Yes. Thank you. I just want to say uh, I want to make three points. Uh, when you talk about the fact that in 2023 you're going through what you're going through, and God bless you, and I commend you and Tanika and Mice and, and all the freedom fighters. That's because democracy is not a gift. Democracy is sustained. I want you guys to remember that. 
Democracy is not a gift, it's not a privilege, it's not an entitlement, it's sustained. People died for it, Martin Luther King, so many of our ancestors died for it, fought for it, and we have to keep fighting for it, which brings me to my second point. That's why they have a campaign against wokeism, because they want you to go back to sleep. But if you don't listen to one thing I say today, don't go back to sleep. Stay woke. I don't care how much they try to demonize and they try to vilify being woke as if having consciousness and awareness of right and wrong and your rights and your, your human rights and your civil rights as if there's something perverted about that. But many of our brothers and sisters are still sleeping and slumbering and we need to wake them up. And the, the last thing I wanted to say is that hip hop at 50 is multi cultural. It has so many ethnicities. And that's the power of hip-hop. Hip-hop, you know, it's like you have children. I don't love any of my children more than I love the other. But if we have one child that, that needs a little bit more love, a little bit more help because of the way that they were born, that means all the brothers and sisters need to come together and help that child. So for all of our hip-hop community members that you know, don't suffer the same pains that we do. You're a part of hip hop. You come to the concerts, you got the swag, you got the linguistics, you wear the theme music to your life and we, we receive you. You're a part of the family, but you have to be a part of the solution yeah. for the family. Yeah, that's good. Because the least among us is the most valuable. Amen. And we're judged and determined by the way we treat those people. So Amen. we need to be inclusive and we need to tap in to the different uh, ethnicities and the different people that are part of the hip hop family and make sure they understand their obligation to the hip hop family. It's not just the concert. After the concert, it's the reality that has led to the music that we create that reflects the Breonna Taylors and all the different uh, victimizations and pains that we suffer. So those, those are just the points. Let, let's not act like their white boys aren't listening to Migos on their way to the truck rally. Yeah. But listen, you know, but listen, it's, it's important though, it's important, a point that you made. Uh, you know, I, 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 I believe in humanity. And I know we're at the Congressional Black Caucus, and, but I believe in humanity. So I don't want it to be black, because you got a, a guy in Kentucky that's black. And you're saying over your dead body, he can't be the governor. So, so let's not let colorism, let, let's not let, you know, a race distract us, right? We understand what we have to do for our communities that are impacted, but we need to get everybody on board to help fight this way because we want to get to a point where we don't need a black caucus, where all human beings have the same 24 hours and the same opportunities and there's no discrimination. The reason we have a black caucus, the reason we have a Latin American caucus is because unfortunately the angle that came from Britain and colonized the Americas, you know, they just did what they did for all these hundreds of years and oppressed us and subjugated us and so we've had to dig ourselves out of the grave and so we need yes. what we have now. We should get to a point where we don't need and everybody's equal and everybody gets the same opportunity. That's Thank good. you. That's Thank good. you. I want to, um, we're coming up in the last maybe eight, nine minutes of, of, of uh, growing here unless we got an extension. Um, <laughs> yeah, we hip hop. We'll be here for a little while. But, um, uh, next year, we'll come back. Yeah. Um, hip hop is 50 this year. We've seen all the corporations, organizations, um, all the different places, uh, politics be able to celebrate it. I mean, it is all up and through uh, CDC this year. Uh, it's so much more, I'm sure. But next year, it's 2024. It's a presidential election. Yeah. Hip hop will be 51. I don't know how many people go, 50 so 50 plus one. But I don't know how, oh, that's right, 50 plus one. You probably thought of that really. Um, but it'll be 51. I guarantee you the same amount of energy in from corporations, from the organizations, to make sure, let me put hip hop and all of this past, present, and future glory on the same level. Hip hop's still the number one genre, as we all know. It's, it's still the number one economic driver. It's still the number one driver of culture. Yeah. But we won't have that extra wind behind our backs and all those extra dollars, all those extra platforms and 
front page of Amazon, front page of Netflix, front page of the, the internet. What we're going to be able to fight next year, starting at the top at the presidential, where you're not voting just for people, you're voting for policies, all the way down to our local uh, governors. I, I, I played in the race last year with Charles Brooks, and believe me, I am so as a Cameron and as a Cameron, I, this is so fair from that Cameron. But uh, how do we, and how do you on this stage in the world, I'd like everybody just to quickly talk about what we can do to sustain the energy, because I've never seen, in my 40 years, never seen the amount of corporate, organizational synergy and energy around the culture. But it's 51, it won't be sexy, it's not in much line, line items like it was this year. But next year it's that much more important for hip hop to be in the streets, the people, you are hip hop, for you to be in the, for you to be in the streets. What do you see as an opportunity or something that, uh, and this is for everybody on the panel, for hip hop as a culture, as artists, as a community, to ensure that when we're not as celebrated, it's not in front streets, but to take what's going to happen and what it means next year to vote in November as serious as possible. You know what's more important than corporate America and financiers and special interests? The people. Yes. And you know why the people are more important? Because the people have the most powerful thing. The vote. Yes. Yeah. The vote. Don't sell your vote. No one can buy your vote. And you have to go out and vote. Yes. Amen. If you don't vote, you're as responsible for electing uh, white supremacists and Amen. the yeah. people that want to destroy America. Yeah. Because America's not, the America that I grew up in, I mean, you know, it was difficult, but as you said, it's become, it, it has in some regards become worse as much as there's been progress. Um, but that's because, again, there's this campaign for you to go back to sleep. Yeah. That's why they're campaigning against woke. So if you're awake, stay awake. Stay woke. Woke, woke, woke. So Ron DeSantis or whoever uh, gets sick in the head, stay awake. Good. And for those that you are sleeping, please wake up. Yes. Because you have to be a part of the voting process. Yeah. This is life or death. You know, I'm not trying to get involved in American politics. Uh, I'm not telling you who to vote for. But go out and vote, and yeah, vote for yeah. the things that matter to your community and to your society. And don't think, as as the sister said, don't think about just your family and, and your tax bracket. Yeah. Think about the village. Yeah. You can't be in the room together as the village and be at the concert together as the village. But you know, I'm I'm gonna vote for our old boy because you know he's better for for my money. I need to get my bag because you won't be able to enjoy the bag. There's a story in the Bible about a, a queen by the name of Esther. And when she became the queen, um, you know, her uncle came to her because there was a gentleman that wanted to kill, you know, all of her people, the, the, the Jews, the Israelites, the Hebrews. And her uncle came to, to her and he started fasting. And he said, listen, you need to save your people because if you don't save your people, you know, you're next, you're gonna go too. Don't think that we're gonna die and you're gonna live. So make sure you go out and vote, yeah. and, and that's that's you better, you better preach vote. Hey, yeah. You know, it's, it's so funny. Um, I, I'm so woke, Sam. <laughs> and I get so woke. I'm so woke, Sam. So I, I'm sitting here thinking, and as you say, the 50 plus one in the corporations. See, the the problem is we think we, we've been systematically trained to cycle vote. Mm -hmm. Two years, four years, some case, six years. You should be voting every fucking every day. day. Every day. You know, every but, day. You know I'm, not, I'm not buying this because you ain't for this. You, right? So I'm gonna vote to not vote for you and buy from you. And for people who actually support things and, and organizations, see, to, to me, just like we built them, we can tear them down. That's right. And we gotta vote every single day. My problem might not be your problem today, but it might be your uncle's or brother's or son's problem tomorrow. So we have to vote every single day. And we have to have the conversation behind the conversation to make sure we're doing it as a community. Right. Our biggest issue, we have politicians, we have 
money, we have activists, but that a bill will get passed that can help me that I don't even know about. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't, I can't over activists linger and until free, I gotta let them do what they do. And then they have to make sure I'm in line and doing what I do. We all gotta play, this is an ecosystem. Yeah. Because if we set the ecosystem up right, yeah. we ain't gotta thank nobody for nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. And with this whole thing about affirmative action and the whole the whole thing about it, they do with colleges now. It's gonna come around everything. But I'm tired of fucking asking for a handout. Right. I'm personally tired of people saying, "Oh, you know, we need y'all to do this for us." Come on, come on. Wow. That's right. That's right. We need to make sure policy and us and activism have a strategy yes, yes. together. Because the only way it works is if we create our own ecosystem. Yes, yes. And the last point to shine, uh, you go to one of my artist concerts, go to Rolling Loud, 85% of this non-African American people. That's right. So hip hop has no color. By the way, we're colorists. We were created out of necessity from the color. But we are truly colorless. We're not blind. And we're not going to go to sleep. Because I'm telling everybody, I'm, I'm with Shana, do not let this process of, oh, you got to go to school and spend $400,000 on education to not get a job. I used to play with football, and I never knew I could make them. I used to, we play with electronics, we didn't know we could make them. Now we have a world that's App, every app, anywhere, and we don't want to have our kids make them because we feel we got to go get this and that and that. I, I told my kids, here's your fun, whatever you want to do, you got to finish college, that's cool, but whatever you want to do, dream the impossible dream. That's right. Because I'm living proof, Sean is living proof that we can do whatever we put our mind to. Yeah. But you got to stay more. I just want to say, one, we created something today in this room. Hip hop, 50 plus one. So that's amazing. We have to get that today. That will be probably, hopefully going through next year. Also, Hip Hop Caucus turns 20 next year. So, you know, y'all can clap for that, okay? Uh, pretty excited. But I actually want to ask you for something because you can help right now. Uh, our brothers and our sisters and our non-binary cousins who are in Atlanta, Georgia, are fighting to stop cops in. And they're doing everything in their power to stop that. And so right after this, in, in room 103B, that's media room 103B, please, I, I'm asking, 103B Media Room. Myself, Amanda Seals, uh, Kendrick Sampson, I believe Linda, and some others. Kevin and Sean will show up. But we are going to be showing up to do that press conference. And the more you who are there to stand in solidarity, because budgets are moral documents. Yes. And where they put the money, if they're saying that we got to put more money not to mental health, right. not to health care, not to helping the unhoused. We gotta put more money to incarcerate. That is telling you something there alone. And so I would hope that you would join me in my caucus at in room 103B, the media room. If any question about voting, please go to our respectmyvote.com, respectmyvote.com campaign. It is now the oldest and most successful, even more than voter die, hip hop voting campaign, working on those who are returning citizens. But we do need a strategy, and hip hop caucus has one. But more important, we have to have an inside outside strategy That's to it. ensure the liberation of our people. Yeah. God bless you. That's right. Thank you. I also wouldn't be an organizer if I didn't ask you for some things, too. Yes, yeah, Linda. <laughs> The people doing the work shouldn't also have to be asking you for money. Yeah. 
Because that's a waste of time. Because we're trying to be outside, we're on the doors, we're organizing the community, we're trying to keep the people outside, we're doing the political education, educating people about what the policy platforms are, giving them the informed vote. Because in order for people to vote, regardless of how they vote, they've got to have the information. And that requires people like us to be outside as these communities doing that type of education. We just had a town hall the other day in Louisville, Kentucky. We actually opened an office in West Market Street in Louisville, Kentucky, so we could be there and have presence in the room. And so we're organizing and we on the phone. Kevin, this one, I, the money's there. We know that the communities we come from and the people that support the work that we do got the money. Yeah. But we got to spend time asking for the money. Write the proposal, write the thing. Someone wants it all. They want you to send them a deck. I don't got time to design a deck because I'm outside. So that's what they tell me. Design it, put some pictures in there. So you know we outside. So why do I got to put a picture in the deck and make it in color and print it out for you? Put it in a thing and send it to the thing and then we got to do a meeting with you but you are so busy I can't meet you for four months. Guess what? Daniel Cameron's about to be the governor in November 7th if we don't get our act together and start putting some money in the streets and on them kids and pay field organizers get more people on the doors. In Kentucky, there are 55,000 more Republicans registered in the state of Kentucky than there are Democrats. Andy Bashir in 2019, who's the current Democratic governor, only won by 5,000 votes. That's like maybe two, three votes a precinct. This is cl a close race. And the reason why I bring this emphasis on this particular race is because it sets a precedent for 2024 that you do not want. Yeah. You do not want a Mitch McConnell back Trump endorsed candidate yeah. going to the highest office in Kentucky. Because Daniel Cameron got his sights on higher than Kentucky. You best to believe this man is going to show up in 2028 and he's yeah. gonna run for president of the United States of America. Yeah. And might actually get a shot, because if Trump can go to the White House, I tell you Daniel Cameron can go to the White House. Wow. So my ask to all of you is, put some money on the table. Yeah. Imagine if a thousand people gave $10 a month to an organization like Until Freedom. That's $10,000 a month. You know how much $10,000 a month can do for an organization that is outside on the street? No. People on, go to Starbucks and you spend $7 sometimes on a latte. Yes. Why don't you say, you know what, one day a month I'm not going to go, I'm going to bring my sandwich from home and I'm not going to go to the coffee shop and I'm going to put my $10 on an organization that I see doing the work outside. Yes. So because that gives us the time to do the work that needs to be done. And it's what we tell the artists all the time. Put some money on the table. We have had supportive artists across the, and, and, I, and I appreciate Kevin saying that because people like Kevin get to, you know, Rock Nation gets to tell their people like this, the people outside that you need to be supporting. So I appreciate the support that has come. But the money has dried up. Yeah. At the time that it's the most dangerous. So I'm calling on you until freedom. We are until freedom on every platform. Yes. Drop $20, drop $50, $1,000 if you can, $10 a month is what I would prefer. Because that means that you're making a commitment. A commitment means that every month you want to give this organization ten dollars. So, and I'm and I'm using Until Freedom as an example because that's the organization that I come from. But guess what? In your local community, there are people outside, around the corner from you, doing really good work. A food pantry, or an organization working with homeless youth, or 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 mentorship for young black boys. Give them ten dollars a month. Give them fifty dollars a month. So. Do not allow us to have to go to the corporations or to have to bow down or to have to reframe our message because somebody doesn't want to give us money because we're too spicy. We're going to be spicy when you say what needs to be said, so allow us to be that. And let you be the funders of the movement and don't allow us to have to go to those that are going to tell us how to run the movement. We want your money and we want your support. It's 2.15 in room 103B. 2.15 in room 103B. My ask is that you visit me in Belize. Yes. Yes. Tell me when you get to the airport, I'll get a sea shower. I want you to come. I want, I want you to come next week. The elections are, are, are next year, March 2024 and uh, 2025. But you can start coming down from now. All right? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm <laughs> 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 